Well, hello, and thank you so much to the SNA for the opportunity to present two daggers from Bristol Museum and Art Gallery at the conference today. And I'm really sorry not to be there, especially as I would like to thank uh, my project collaborators, Naomi Rubenstein from the University of Liverpool and Gail Boyle from Bristol Museums in person. And an uh, advance warning, I will be showing uh, drawings of a skeleton and two mummies. So how did this project come about? Well, in May of this year, Gail Boyle gave an online lecture about the artifacts in the Dr. Fawcett collection of typology. And she showed this uh, green patinaed dagger as a possible object that had been purchased at auction um, from the uh, American newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst, who was a big collector of Egyptian antiquities. But without any deeper history mentioned in the archive, what could we ever learn about its provenance? The dagger was instantly recognisable to me because of work I'd been doing as part of the master's programme at the University of Edinburgh, so I was really excited to contribute to Gail's research. As I checked up uh, the accession number on the Bristol Collections uh, web pages, I happened upon a second dagger, and this one was in quite a sorry state, having lost its pommel and its handle parts, but it was obviously one of the same type. This had been connect, collected by Mr. Charles Richard Mapp, a fellow of the Royal Geogra Geographical Society and a lecturer at a Chatham College, and his hobby was collecting Egyptian relics. In fact, he built up quite a collection, which was bequeathed to the museum after his death in 1956. The curator at the time, Leslie Grinsell, recalled that the Mapp collection had contained a fair proportion of modern fakes. So now we had two Egyptian star daggers, one with a possible illustrious past and one with a very large question mark, um, and neither had details going back further than the late 1930s. It had become quite a project. And it's also quite an honour to present these artefacts to such an expert group today, and I would love to have your opinion on the project so far at the end of the talk. So what are these daggers? The both of the Bristol daggers have kind of fallen on hard times and mislaid most of their parts, but here's a complete example from the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. It's what the daggers probably would have looked like when they were new. They usually had a bright white cream ivory pommel, and that was usually made out of hippopotamus ivory, but as you can see, this is the only example with a limestone pommel. Um, the Bristol daggers are missing their wooden inlays for the handle, which would have been held in place by, by copper rivets. And some of those had gilded heads, some were made out of gold, some were made out of silver. In fact, the handle could be made out of these different metals as well. Uh, blades were usually of either arsenical copper or tin bronze. And that's actually what's really interesting about these objects. We haven't really looked at very many uh, um, for, to work out their composition. But I wondered if that might have something to tell us about the evolution and development of these objects. Following up on the idea that perhaps the Fawcett dagger could have come via Hearst, perhaps it could have come from one of the um, digs that he financially supported in Sudan and in Egypt, the earliest of these was the Joint Harvard University and Boston Museum expedition from 1913 to 1916, which mainly excavated the huge tumuli in the south of the um, Eastern Cemetery. And these were nearly 80 meters wide and very tall when George Andrew Reisner, who was the head of the expedition, first saw them. They found an awful lot of burials within each of the tumuli, and also a lot of daggers. In fact, nearly 150 daggers have come from the uh, cemetery of Kush, cemetery of Kerma in Kush so far. And this is where things get a little bit sticky for the traditional cultural attribution of these daggers as being Egyptian. When George Andrew Reisner was making his interpretations of the cemetery at Kerma in the early 1900s, Nubian archaeology was really in its infancy, and it was still believed that Pharaonic Egypt had control over all of Nubia during the whole of the Middle Kingdom. He believed that 
What he was finding inside the tumuli were graves of the Egyptian overseers of an Egyptian colony, and so the daggers he found there were Egyptian. And this bias has stuck, at least until excavations by the University of Geneva from the 1970s onwards proved that Kerma had actually been independent of Egypt until well into the New Kingdom at about 1500 BCE. So it had always been Kerman leaders who were buried in the tumuli, and their daggers probably represent an aspect of Nubian heritage as well as Egyptian. So the Kerman daggers make up quite a, a big chunk of the known corpus. In fact, the most comprehensive study of these daggers has been achieved by Suzanne Petrel of the University of Munich, and she consulted hundreds of excavation reports and catalogues of private collections, as well as physically scouring the museums. Um, it was all collated in the 1990s and published in 2011. Her typology is only available, sadly, in German language hardback publication, but it's full of line drawings and grayscale images of the daggers. Nearly half of the complete daggers that she lists, however, could not be connected to any excavation. And the slide is quite full, but I've tried to indicate here the main types and their relative amounts and the time span that they're attested for, according to Petra's typology. Our Bristol daggers quite clearly belong to type 3, and this type has the longest tradition from the 11th through to the 17th dynasty and has the most diverse ownership. They're buried with Egyptian elites in rock-cut tombs, with the Kerman elites in uh, tumuli, and intriguingly, about 10% at least of this type of dagger is found in burials of middle Nubian pastoralists, mobile groups that um, are buried in both Egypt and Nubia. These mobile groups moved up and down the Nile and they had close relationships with settled Egyptians whilst they maintained their own distinct cultural identity. And in fact, in recent years, their um, history and heritage and uh, material culture is being uh, reassessed. And it's a very interesting story. The Type 3 daggers then are noteworthy for lasting almost 500 years and bridging cultures all along the Nile Valley. But the Bristol daggers are not in this published typology. On the good side, we've rediscovered some forgotten daggers. On the other hand, Susan Petrel did uh, a very amazing job of collating this, so this made me question how Hearst would first come into possession of the Fawcett dagger in any way, and had it been from distributions, from perhaps from other excavations he'd helped to fund. The short answer to that is probably not. This fabulous website, The Artifacts of Excavation, is a joint project between UCL and the University of Oxford, and it was specifically set up to trace museum acquisitions, especially from projects from the Egyptian Exploration Fund. Seven years on, and the team has scanned in reports and letters and distribution lists and excavator's notebooks, and they probably deserve an award for the transcription of some of these excavators' handwriting. But the team notes that objects were normally sent directly to museums as gifts of the benefactors, and only very occasionally did private individuals receive small numbers of what were considered to be duplicate or less valuable objects for their private collections. So it is possible that the daggers, the Bristol daggers, came through that kind of route. There's another great website that I use called the Internet Archive, which is um, free literature from American libraries. And just at the bottom there, you can see that this was a, on the left, you can see this with the sale of Canon Greenwell and his private collection. And the description there of his two daggers that he was selling are very ornate, and they are not in Petrel's typology either, or not in any museum that I've found. So I wonder if the Bristol daggers were found Earlier on, maybe in the 1800s, um, and a description of them might turn up in some very early excavation reports or some memoirs. And I wanted to share with you this fantastic resource from the Heidelberg Historic Library. And what they've done is they've digitized all those wonderful quartos and enormous huge cloth-bound books that used to be at the far end of your library. And um, the great big advantage over the physical resource here is that, that they've all been converted using OCR into fully text searchable documents, including their original indices. Sadly, 
there's been no mention of the tiny needle of hope about the Bristol daggers in this huge haystack of excavation reports. But one thing that did come up time and time again is this, even in this um, our book here by De Morgan from 1894, was that many of the tombs that he was uh, trying to excavate in Darshur, for example, had been looted well before the end of the New Kingdom, and he suspected this would be so experienced, it was almost official. And looting, of course, of Egyptian artifacts has always been lucrative. Whether this was just for the blade, say, of daggers, for metal recycling, and of course, excavators have, or have found lonely ivory pommels and rivets left behind in, in burials. During the early 1900s, this was dealer organized, and um, objects might be dropped in between tombs when a better object was found, and these would then corrode on the surface or, or in a different um, tomb. And you can see um, a comment there from Arthur Mace's notebook where he says that, you know, one day they might just go out, be sent to some tombs, get there, they've all been looted out and come home for lunch with nothing to show for it. So where I spent most of my time, of course, looking for stylistic similarities and, and uh, comparative objects was deep in online museum collections. And frankly, it's astonishing that over the last decade, so many museums have put their collections online. There's photographs, artifact dimensions, bibliographic information. It's a really incredible amount of work by curators and museum volunteers. Some museums make their full record available, and that's downloadable documents. Oh, fantastic, and uh, really appreciated. I really appreciated the way a copyright was unambiguous, uh, perhaps through a Creative Commons Zero license. I did come up against a few online search challenges. Mostly, this was when non-specific top-level descriptions are displayed instead of, say, thumbnail images or something a bit more, um, more in-depth. Um, occasionally, museums make no distinction between ethnographic and ancient objects in their search results, which means that every single record for knife or dagger or sword would come up. And, that's quite a lot sometimes, and, um, but I did earn an awful lot that way. There's a great diversity in dagger styles around the world and throughout time. Um, and many culture traditions do go back thousands of years. So it's very interesting to see that working through. The context of dagger signs doesn't often get mentioned in collections details, even in relative databases and kind of put you in touch with the things that go together. Um, and daggers in burials can be associated with other weapons such as axes, but they're just as often found with mirrors or toiletry items. And this really affects our perception of them as a military object versus, say, a rank marker or perhaps having a religious or ritual role. And a new dagger points that out quite nicely. This is an ivory pommel dagger that was found with a priest. His name was Kema, and he was from the 12th uh, dynasty. In fact, he was related to the family of the 12th dynasty governors of Elephantine in um, southern Egypt. The amazing thing about this discovery is that the team from the University of JN in Spain have been able to reconstruct his family tree. And he's actually the son of the second um, husband of a lady called Sac Jenny V. And she herself was the daughter of a governor, and they think this was uh, that it was to keep the governorship in the family, so to speak. The um, Kemmer's sword has been tested, and it seems to be made of tin bronze with a handle of silver. And this handle was actually cast in two parts rather than um, a single way, like the Bristol daggers. And um, also, the wooden inlay is actually just in two parts, a front and a back, rather than the more frequent six pieces. This is very different, and um, it, a visit was in order to go and see, get up close and personal with the four certain map daggers, and, and check out the way that they've been cast. Gail was very generous with her hour and um, a big work desk and free reign to ask lots of annoying pop questions. Um, obviously, I checked dimensions and took lots of photographs, but to hold the daggers in my hand was, of course, absolutely fantastic. It's a real buzz you get from handling such a wonderful object, specially made for a particular person and nearly 4,000 years old. Um, one of the main things was, was holding that dagger 
and seeing whether it fit into my hand and seeing whether the corrosion on the blade would line up with my fingers, perhaps because it was uh, corroded due to a ritual presentation or had it been corroded post-excavation and just been handled around within um, collections or between dealers or something like that. The other great thing about handling uh, the physical object is, of course, the size. And the map dagger really is quite small. And whether that was because it was made as a burial gift for a juvenile, or um, was it just small because that was how much raw material went into it? These are really interesting research questions for further on, of course. We agreed then that our next stage would be working out how much we could find out about the object, maybe some provenance information, from uh, some scientific approaches. And in recent years, there have been some concerted efforts to undertake large-scale metallurgical studies of Egyptian and Nubian objects in museums and collections. There's two research groups in particular have been approaching the provenance idea from a number of different angles. The first group are specifically looking at earliest copper metallurgy using artifacts from the Leipzig Mu University Museum in um, Germany and the Vienna Art Historical Museum. The second group are a larger team looking at the way that the Middle Kingdom and Kerman furnaces worked and how the detritus left behind by alloying and casting, what sort of things that that can tell us. With access to museum collections in Brussels and in Geneva, um, they have ore samples from known mines, which they're analyzing to get a better idea of variation across those ore deposits. And this team are also using experimental archaeology to reproduce um, metalwork and reverse engineer the process that's been used and get a better understanding of the effects that any processes involved would actually have on the final composition of the final finished product. So each stage in the production from raw material through alloying and casting and cooling in a mold and any metals recycling that goes into this should show up in chemical composition of um, Nubian and Egyptian um, metal work. So what the other thing that these groups are doing is really looking for the best scientific techniques for investigating each stage. And what sort of data, what sort of results are coming out of these studies? An awful lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers, really. Um, the table of results I put up here is from the X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy of objects in the G Geneva Museum and those from the casting furnace at Perma in Sudan. For each sample, you've got the copper percentage, and it's shown along with any minor or trace elements per milligram uh, per gram of sample. So you've got trace elements such as silver, gold, cobalt, and nickel that might stay with the copper even after the original ore has been crushed down and smelted to extract metal from the rock. And other elements might be introduced or reduced by the heating process. Usually large amounts of tin or arsenic or lead that show up in these analyses um, are generally understood to indicate intentional alloying. And there may be more de ore deposits, of course, with higher lead or high arsenic, so it's not a wholly straightforward um, system. Now, nowadays, um, the rapid, non-destructive way of analyzing objects in museum environments is using a handheld version of the X-ray fluorescence museum uh, machine. Sorry. Um, but basic spectrographs have been used um, even from early on in Egyptological research. Petrie, in fact, published the results of a few of these studies in his reports. Early spectrographs were not particularly sensitive, but their readings do indicate whether it's arsenic or copper or a tin bronze. So we know already there were general trends, and we know that tin was being introduced to the region at around the start of the Middle Kingdom, right when our daggers were being produced. And uh, so it may be that these daggers are on the leading edge of the change to a tin alloy of, of what we call a true bronze, or perhaps their production was kept traditional with more of an arsenic or copper, or maybe there's experimentation going on. But so few have been studied so far, we don't really know yet. Now, the modern level of precision in these analyses creates an awful lot of numerical values, and these can be plotted against each other. So this plot actually here shows lead isotope study 
of artifacts clustering or not clustering um, with samples from ore deposits. And this is a much more destructive process. Um, the researchers also point out that ore deposits can actually change across the ore field, so there's a lot of variation. However, from all these studies, it is becoming clear that some metal workers routinely use particular proportions of alloying elements to add to their copper. And these processing patterns look a bit like recipes. And as you can see in the table, there's a lot of variation usually between objects. So when numbers do match up, it's reasonably certain you're looking at similar, uh, a batch, say, of a metal alloy made to perhaps one of these recipes. And of course, recipes change over time and with different ore sources or different workshops. But we are hoping that there will be an object already studied that um, can line up with one of these process recipes. And they call this a processual or a process provenance. And maybe we'll find one for the Bristol Daggers. So what do we do? The lovely Naomi Rubenstein from University of Liverpool, who's researching Greek coins, agreed to analyze the daggers for us. Um, she, that was the process that she followed there, scratching off any corrosion or this, this green paint and, um, and testing the pommel. The pommel turned out to be made of gypsum plaster, painted to look like ivory. So that was obviously a later um, change to the dagger. And the other thing about the faucet dagger was this green patina was mainly made out of titanium oxide, which is the, the colorant there. And um, this pigment is not known, said Naomi, before about 1916. So is this paint added to a new and an old part to make them look like the same color? Or is it a dagger that's made up out of two parts from somewhere else, a handle and a blade? We don't know, but it wasn't looking very good for the faucet dagger. The map dagger, however, does look really interesting. And um, what I found was that it, the, the numbers that we're getting for the amount of copper and the different types of alloying and the trace elements, and I've given you a small sample there of just arsenic and lead and tin and um, copper and some iron, just to give you an idea of how they do kind of match into the same area. Um, and the map, so you can see that those minor and trace elements largely agree with the ratios from an axe from a C group burial in Aniba. Those are in Lo and Lubia. And the C group is one of these mobile pastoralist groups, the Pangrave group is the other. And then these people moved around the Nile Valley and actually have burials in Egypt proper, in Nubia as well throughout the Middle Kingdom and Second Intermediate Period. The tin levels in the map dagger show that it was a tin bronze object. And the recipe that has been used for the axe actually was noticed, noticed by the researchers to be very similar to the ingredients in a dagger handle from a later period that's going into the Second Intermediate uh, Period there. But it's so very similar, and both of these objects come from Aniba. So what the um, researchers at Leipzig are saying is that these two objects were from the same process uh, recipe, and there's, they actually think that that recipe included uh, ore from the Sinai. Now, there has been some challenge to linking PXRF results to any ores, and, it, and this kind of went also via the lead isotope route as well. So we'll hold that there, and we'll do some more uh, research, statistic research on the, the map daggers results and move forward from there. So rounding up um, by going back to the faucet dagger and looking at its metal composition in comparison to some other daggers, um, it doesn't match up with a forgery of a dagger for in Leipzig. And then this has been identified because it has 20% of lead, which is really very high and really not seen in Egypt until um, much, much later, about 1000 BC. Um, the researchers also tested the white core of this handle, which was made up of a gypsum plaster mix, although it has a zinc oxide 
pigment instead of the titanium that's been used on the full foot dagger. Whilst I was just putting this talk together, I read a very interesting article by Suzanne Voss from 2014, and she talks about the forgery reports that were put together by Ludwig Borchardt back in the early 1900s. Borchardt was based in Cairo, and one of his um, interests was looking at workshops that were creating replicas. And he said that up until 1906, it was all about selling replicas of ancient Egyptian artifacts that were being found. But by 1908, it had become entirely professional. They were selling forgeries en masse to unsuspecting collectors. And um, these forgery reports were kept secret by Borchardt. In fact, they were specifically made for the German government. Um, and other European groups that were in Egypt at the time did not know about it. So I think that needs to be looked into too. Um, and it's possible that the forged faucet dagger is a mix of a blade and a handle that don't go together, they didn't match in colour, um, they put a, a modern-ish um, pommel on the top in the early 1900s and sold it, sold it on, but only further research will tell. So thank you so, so much for your time listening to this. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thanks to Gail and um, Naomi and to Amal. And uh, any questions, I would love to answer. Thanks again.